Download our complimentary guidebooks, checklists, and other useful financial resources at savantwealth.com slash guides. Thanks for joining us. Today, we are discussing replacing your paycheck in retirement. My name is Karen Fitzgerald. I'm a fi financial advisor and have been in the financial industry for 15 years. Joining me today is Corey Bueller, a fellow financial advisor. Thanks for being here, Corey. Hi, thanks, Taryn. Glad to be here as well. Uh, as Taryn mentioned, my name is Corey Bueller. I work in Savant's downtown Chicago office, and I have been in the financial services industry for the last decade. And again, today we're talking about replacing your paycheck in retirement. You've worked all these years, you've saved throughout those years. Now it's time to start withdrawing those funds. So today, Taryn and I are going to talk about getting a plan in place. We're going to talk through tax strategies to do so and how much you can take in retirement. So moving to the agenda, we're going to start with planning for your first paycheck, then transition to how to make that paycheck last all throughout your retirement and finish with maximizing your take-home pay. And then Taryn and I will be available for a quick period to discuss any questions that come throughout the presentation. Feel free to throw those in the chat. So to start, let's talk about planning for your first paycheck. And there's quite a lot of complexities when we get into this. Again, you, you've worked hard, you've saved your entire life. Now it's time to start withdrawing these funds. How do you go about that, right? And let's just talk about some of the risks that recent retirees are going to face. The first one being with what is a sustainable withdrawal rate? And we'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. But this is how much you can take out in retirement and not have to worry about running out of funds. You also have long longevity risk, which is outliving the funds. And with modern medicine, people are starting to live longer and longer, which is great. You get to experience more years in retirement. Uh, the downside to that is your funds have to last you longer and longer through retirement. Another risk recent retirees face is the savings gap. And the savings gap is the, the gap between your fixed income and in retirement and how much you need to withdraw from your savings that you have accrued throughout the year. So fixed income being you know, Social Security, any pensions that you might have. Let's just say you need to spend $8,000 per month. You have $4,000 in fixed income. Where's that additional $4,000 coming from? Inflation is another topic that's become more relevant over the last couple of years. Back in 2022, inflation spiked all the way up to 9%. And it slowly started to come back down through 2023 and through the first quarter of 2024. But you need to make sure that your funds in retirement can withstand the impact of inflation. And then finally, market volatility. Market volatility is something we've all experienced. No matter what age you are watching this presentation, the stock and bond markets, they go up and down every year. We've seen some big swings recently. And if you're in your younger working career, it's not as big of a deal because you have plenty of time to ride that wave, let the market come back from any downturns that we see like we did in 2020 and 2022. When you're about to retire or in retirement, you don't have as long as a time frame, and you're starting to take funds from the portfolio. So market volatility becomes a lot more important. All right, so these are some of the many risks that recent retirees and people in retirement face. So let's dig into what a sustainable withdrawal rate looks like. And before I even get into this, the answer and a lot of the recommendations that Taryn and I are going to talk about today, everyone has their own personal situation. So we'll talk about some generalities, what a lot of people say, um, but your situation is different than everyone else's because we all have different goals in retirement and we all have different risk appetites on how much risk we want to take in the portfolio. So when we're talking about a sustainable withdrawal rate, you see the, the range on the screen. You'll notice anywhere from 1% to 4%, you're in that green area. And a lot of experts over the last 20, 30, 40 years, 4% is what they've stated. If you take 4% from your portfolio, you'll be fine and you won't run out of money. Once you creep into 5, 6, 7, 8 or more percent of a withdrawal rate, 
that's where you're probably going to run into the risk of running out of money. But again, what are the important factors? One is your time frame. The longer time frame you have in retirement, the longer the funds are going to need to last you, as well as your asset allocation. People that take more risk should expect to earn more return in their portfolio. If you earn more in your portfolio, that's going to allow you to take more funds out and increase that withdrawal rate. If you're more conservative in retirement, you're going to expect to earn less rate of return, and that's going to lower the sustainable withdrawal rate for you. That's the general rule. We, we tend to stick to 4%, but what Taryn and I are going to talk about today and what we do at Savant is we always bring it back to the financial plan. So you're getting ready to retire. Let's talk about what steps you need to take. The first one, when you're planning for that first paycheck, go ahead and assess where you're at with your current situation. And what we recommend is let's create a net worth statement. And that's just gathering all the resources you currently have at hand. So the sources of retirement income I'm talking about, think about cash accounts, whether it's your checking, your savings account, or your emergency fund. Then you have your qualified retirement accounts, things like traditional and Roth 401ks, 403bs, and IRAs. Then you have your brokerage accounts, or what's called a taxable investment account. That can be an individual account, a joint account, or even a trust account. Then you move into the fixed income side of things. So things like Social Security, most of us will be eligible for. And right now, you can take that early at age 62. For most people that are near in retirement, their full retirement age is 67. And then if you delay till age 70, you're going to get the biggest bang for your buck and the biggest payout in retirement. Not everyone has access to a pension, but some people do have pensions still available to them. That's another source of fixed income. And then you have part-time income and rental income. This isn't the expansive list, but this details a lot of what we see when it comes to retirement income for our clients. And that's step number one. It's the easier part. Just gather all the resources you have at hand and whether you want to throw them in an Excel spreadsheet whether you have an advisor, we just recommend building that net worth statement. The much more difficult part, or step two, is assessing your sources of retirement spending, right? This is how much you're going to spend in retirement. And let's look at what your current spending is now. And no one likes the word I'm about to say next, but it's all about creating a budget and looking at what your current spending is. Um, and just to be honest, when we talk about budget, a lot of people cringe. They don't like that word. And it's because it takes work, right? And it takes time in order to track your spending. So our recommendation is when you're building a budget worksheet, keep it high level, right? You don't need to go into the nitty gritty and track every expense. You can lump them in to larger categories. Uh, so think about mortgage or rent, your housing expense. You have groceries, utilities, car payments and then just personal spending. You don't have to detail everything out uh, because the more detail you get, the longer it's gonna take, and the longer it's gonna take, the more likely it is that you're gonna give up that budget tracking. Another way to keep it high level is just monitoring your cash reserves versus your take-home pay. And what I mean by that is, let's say you have a take-home pay of $2,500 a month, and that already excludes your taxes, uh, any retirement savings and things like health insurance. So you take home 2,500. All you have to do then is track your cash, your checking and your savings account. If that stays level over a three or six month period, that means you're spending that take home pay of 2,500 per month. If your cash goes up, then you're spending less than a 2,500 and your cash flow positive, as we like to say. If your cash is going down, that means you're spending more than that $2,500. And if you're new to budgeting, that's where I encourage people to start is just track where your cash reserves are. So go onto your banking platform and you can look back for the last three to six months and just see where it's been at. And that gives a good idea of how much you're spending per month. 
And then just know there are tools available to you. There are plenty of budgeting tools online. Mint used to be a big one. That's now gone away. But there are plenty of other tools out there, both paid and unpaid. And then we also at Savant have this budget worksheet that we're more than happy to share with you. If you're interested, just let us know. So the first two steps, build your net worth statement, start budgeting to see how much you spend. The third step then is building your financial plan. And this is one of the core offerings we provide at Savant. This is what Taryn and I do a lot of our day to day is building financial plans and work to see what's attainable in retirement. And it's one house for all the data that we've talked about today. The financial plan should have all of your spending goals, and that's going to be done via the budgeting to see, okay, what expenses are going to continue in retirement, what expenses are going to be new, and then what expenses will drop off. So maybe you have your house paid off by the time you retire, or the kids are out of your house and no longer on your payroll. It's also going to hold the net worth statement we talked about. It's going to have all your resources. The purpose of this financial plan is all about answering the two questions on the screen here is how much can I spend and how much risk do I need to take? And really Taryn and I's job, it's all about reducing uncertainty. We wanna provide you confidence and clarity in your retirement picture and eliminate debt, stress and uncertainty so that you can retire comfortably and know that you're in a good spot. And a lot of people don't do that. They work so hard throughout their career and they just don't know when they can retire and how much they can spend well, that's what building this financial plan does. It gives you that clarity to tell you, okay, you can spend this amount per year all throughout your lifetime, and you should be in relatively good shape. But building the financial plan, that's only one part of it. Then we need to stress test it. And from there, we can start what we like to call scenario planning to say, okay, your base plan is successful. What else can we look at? And Taryn and I's job is to not only do that, but then monitor it on an ongoing basis because life's going to change, right? The stock market's going to go up and down. It's going to do its thing, but also major life events are going to happen. Maybe you want to move to another state. Maybe you have another child. So as that happens, we update the plan just to see that you're still on track. So I mentioned stress testing the plan on the last slide. Here's what I mean by that. And the software we utilize at Savant uh, it's called Monte Carlo analysis. So we keep your goals and your resources the same. And we run 1,000 iterations. The only difference in those 1,000 iterations is investment performance. We want to stress test the plan to say, what happens to the plan in good years, neutral years, and bad years to see how many of those iterations pass? And on the screen, you'll see the meter to the right. It shows a 75% success rate. To explain what the meter represents, you'll see the three colors. The purple is the below the confidence zone, anything under 75%. The green section, that is the confidence zone, and that's actually what we target. We're targeting the 75 to 85% success rate, which seems a, lot, a little counterintuitive, but I'll explain a little why. And then the blue zone is above the confidence zone. That's 85% all the way up to 99. That's as high as it goes. Why we want to go into the confidence zone, 75 to 85%, is because contrary to what we were taught in school, right, 75 or 70%, that's like a C or a D, um, that's what we're targeting here. And it's because we don't need it to be 99%. If you're 90% and above, you're most likely giving up or sacrificing things now. You know, maybe you could retire earlier. Maybe you could spend more in retirement or take less risk because if you're achieving your financial goals in 99% of the scenarios, that, e that means you're even achieving your goals in very bad market years, right? So you're planning for the absolute worst. We want to be in between 75 and 85% because that means in three quarters of the times, you can achieve all your goals without any worry. And the other quarter Maybe you did hit bad market years right when you retired or a string of them throughout your retirement. Well, that just means we can adjust the plan as we go, but we don't necessarily need to only plan for that negative or that bad 25% of years. 
all right, let's plan to get in the 75 to 85%. And if that negative 25% happens, then we adjust accordingly. Maybe you spend less in retirement in your later years, which is what we see a lot of the time anyway. So we talked about stress testing. Now let's talk about scenario planning. And you'll see three scenarios on our screen with three different meters. The first being this base scenario. You'll notice the confidence zone. We're at 88%. We're just above it. It gives us flexibility now to start scenario planning and to say, okay, you're in a good spot. What else can you do? And you'll see to the scenarios to the right, we have a retire early scenario where maybe you get to cut off a few years of your working life and retire earlier. And that gets us down to 76%. We're perfectly comfortable with that. Or maybe you want to spend more in retirement. So we increase the, the living expenses, drops us down to 82%. Again, that's the high end of the confidence zone. So we're very confident with that as well. But the purpose with this scenario planning, again, it's to show the range of possibilities. So we've talked about how to make the plan now. Build the net worth, do a little budgeting to see how much you need to spend in retirement, and then crafting that financial plan. Let's talk about how to make your paycheck last, which is more going to focus on the investment allocation side. And so the first chart I'm going to show you here, it details the investment growth of stocks, bonds, treasury bills, and inflation. And essentially, this chart shows if you invested a dollar back in 1926, what did that dollar grow to? at the end of last year. So it's about a 98 year time frame. And we'll start with inflation. Inflation averaged 3% over the last 98 years, just under 3%. So $1 grew to $17 at the end of last year. Treasury bills grew to $23. One grew to 23, just about 3.3% growth year over year. And then long-term government bonds grew to $136 it averaged just above 5% rate of return from 1926 till the end of last year. When we look at large stocks, that's where we see the first big gap. $1 in 1926 grew to almost $14,570, or a 10% growth rate over that 98 years. And small stocks actually had an 11.8% growth rate so every dollar you invested grew to almost $57,900. And I want to emphasize the gap there between small and large stocks, right? Because the rate of return difference is only 1.5%. If you go from 11.8 to 10.3, that's only 1.5%. But this is the, the power of compound growth. That 1.5% rate of return led to over $43,000 of growth per dollar you invest it, okay? So we talked about building that financial plan. What's important and what that plan will solve for is how much risk do you need to take in your plan, both while you're working and while you're in your retirement years to achieve your goals? And it's gonna be a mix of everything on the screen. You're gonna wanna have large and small stocks, US International, and some fixed income in there as well. And the, the last slide I have today before I pass it back to Taryn is this, what we call a risk reward chart. And this report is part of our financial planning software. And it shows you the probability of success of your financial plan at every type of asset allocation. So on the screen in the middle, here's our probability of success. Here are the different risk allocations. So for instance, the diversified plus 70. This is a 70% stock, 30% bond allocation. On the right here, you'll see a safety margin. This is the dollars that are projected to be left over once you pass away and your plan ends. In this scenario, you'll see the diversified 70, 80, 90, they're all in the blue, a little bit above the confidence zone at 87 and 88%. The diversified 50 and 60 are within that confidence zone. And as you take a little less risk and get from anywhere from zero to 40, now you're below the confidence zone. So the financial plan not only tells you how much risk you need to take, 
um, in order to achieve your goals, but it'll also show you if you continue to take more risk, how much is going to be left over when the plan ends. And that's this for this right column here to say, okay, as you take more risk, you're going to be projected to leave more and more to your heirs. Or maybe that allows you, again, to retire earlier or spend more in retirement. So that's the last of my slides now. I'm going to pass it off to Taryn to talk not only about tax strategies in retirement, but also a bucketing philosophy. So take it away, Taryn. All right. Thanks, Corey. Great information there. So to kind of piggyback on the allocation and confirming that within the financial plan, there's something that you can consider, which is called a bucket strategy to confirm that allocation. So this strategy will provide both some stability in providing a consistent paycheck, as well as the benefits of compounding growth over time, like Corey discussed before. We want to think about your portfolio just a little bit differently in retirement. The projections that Corey showed will help confirm allocation and tell you that you're right on track, but it's also helped, helpful to think in terms of what you need based on your time horizon, hence these buckets here. That's going to help you not be as worried about market risks. We want to have a sustainable long-term plan in retirement. So knowing what each bucket serves to do is important. So the first bucket here is the shortest term of possible needs. It's going to have one to two years of your cash flow needs that are put into liquid uh, accounts. So those are going to be your high yield savings accounts, your CDs, just because they're not as tied to market risks. And so you're able to you know, withdraw from that easily and not worry about what's going on in the market. So let's say that after Social Security income, you need $60,000 of cash flow needs. You may consider putting in your short-term bucket $60,000 to $120,000 in high-yield savings. You can think of this as your emergency savings account. And I'm not necessarily saying either that you need to withdraw from that first, but you do know that if the market does take a downturn, you have your short-term needs available for you in this bucket. For various reasons that I'll discuss later, you may tap into these buckets at different times, so not necessarily one year, two year time frame, or you know five year planning it out that way. But it's good to know that the buckets are covered in each scenario. On the next slide, we will discuss discuss the other two buckets you see here. Okay, so now focusing on the other two buckets. Now we know that your short term needs are are taken care of in a high yield savings or a CD. This is where your stock to bond allocation will be important. So five years worth of net cash flow needs in the intermediate term bucket, which is that yellow one there, could be appropriate. We know that bad market years are unavoidable as an investor. Historically, bear markets happen every five to six years and take about a year or so to recover. So you already have the one to two years of short term available to you in that high yield savings or CD. So five years might be appropriate to put into your intermediate term bucket. This is going to be investments such as intermediate term bonds that keep in pace within the inflation risk that Corey discussed earlier, and it's going to produce some income for you. There's going to be a lower risk associated than more growth oriented stocks or um, you know high yield bonds. Think about the person that I just mentioned before that needed $60,000 for cash flow. We could fill the intermediate term bucket with five years worth of cash flow needs. So this would equal about $300,000. And then the rest of the port portfolio would be designed for appreciation for growth. And that's gonna be important to the longevity of your portfolio. Now, keep in mind, these are high le level examples, but it is helpful to know some key parts on deciding how to allocate your money in retirement. Every person's needs is gonna vary. So it's going to depend on, you know, that financial plan that Corey went through and really going back to that ultimately. But this is a nice way to really know and feel comfortable that you're taking care of for these stages of life. One more consideration is depending on market appreciation, the income that's being produced and some tax planning, which we'll discuss later, you may tap into the buckets at various times because they're being invested a little bit differently, right? So the key is to try to keep a general amount in each bucket, but you may shift more into the short-term needs if you have like a large purchase coming up like a house. Also, these buckets are not necessarily various accounts. It's more of a mental accounting. So each just for each type of investment that is associated with different types of risks. If you have a million dollar brokerage account, for example, you could have 30% in the bond portfolio and that would meet your intermediate term bucket needs and then the rest in equities, and that would meet your long-term bucket needs. 
And in other words, that could be that 70 to 30 percent stock to bond allocation that Corey showed on the risk and reward chart just a few slides ago. So on this next slide, we'll discuss why using buckets is so beneficial. So the benefit of these buckets are psychological. It helps ease market anxiety that we all kind of have when the market goes down. And I can't tell you how important this is, especially in our experience, keeping your growth money invested and not abandoning your long-term strategy during a time when the market is down might be, might, might be one of the most important decisions that you can make. It's also practical. It just kind of makes sense, right? It provides you with the option to use different buckets for different purposes, allowing you to know that your short-term needs are taken care of and that you do actually have that growth for the longevity of your portfolio. In this next section, we will focus on strategies that will help you maximize your dollars. So we're going to kick it off with everyone's favorite subject, taxes. So make sure you have coffee. Um, when we we're thinking about stretching your dollars, we should really be thinking about how we can minimize dollars that go out for things like taxes, right? So after walking through the exercises Corey went through of the financial planning, budgeting, um, all that great stuff, we know how much we need to be spending in retirement. The question will be, well, how much do I really need to take out of my portfolio or my different investments to cover also taxes? Now, working with a financial planner or an accountant can help you uncover this question, as well as plan for future tax burdens. So let's discuss what tax planning really means. So as the saying goes, people don't plan to fail, but they fail to plan. Once a return is being prepared, there's like there's not too much that you can really do about how your tax year overall went. And so that's why tax planning is so important. We want to be proactive at looking at income projections and looking for tax savings throughout the year. But we also want to look at not just what's happening now, but how we can set us ourselves up for long-term success. So overall, this is going to be an active approach in tax planning, and it could really add to your bottom line substantially over time, and I'm going to show you that. So where to begin? First is to know your tax brackets. Now, I don't mean memorize tax brackets because they do change every single year, but if you can work with your accountant or your financial planner, they can help you determine where your bracket is now. And then based on that information, you'll know how much room is left in your tax bracket. So if you need to realize more income in a year, you're aware of the limits in that bracket. It also helps us determine how to withdraw from the various accounts that you may hold. Tax consequences from an IRA to a Roth IRA to a brokerage account are going to be different but more on that later. Finally, you might start to think about future tax brackets. For example, if I'm in the 22% tax bracket right now, but I know in a few years I will be adding in social security income or a pension that will likely increase my bracket in the future, it might be time to start thinking about accelerating income in this lower tax bracket in anticipation that my bracket will be at higher in the future. This is what I mean by tax planning. It's a detailed process that looks at not only now, but to the future, and this is really gonna impact you long-term. Before I go any further, I do wanna draw attention to IRMA. So this is something that can be overlooked when we're looking at tax planning because it's not necessarily on your tax return. IRMA is the income-related monthly adjustment amount. So this is how your Medicare premiums are calculated. So it actually looks at your total income which includes dividends, IRA distribution, Social Security, pretty much everything. And the fun part about it all is, is that it's looking at two years prior return. So in other words, if we're looking at increasing income in 2024, my Medicare premiums would not be adjusted until 2026. This can be a surprise since many of us forgot what we did yesterday, much less you know two years ago. So we should be aware of it when we're looking at tax planning. Like I said, it, it's not on a tax return, so we we coin this as a hidden tax, but something to be aware of when we're trying to plan for the future. And since today's topic is actually on retirement too, it's good to know this. If you had higher working years and now you're retired, um, you were likely going to have your Medicare pre premiums based on when you were working, which could have been higher income. You can contact the Social Security office and they'll adjust your premiums based on this loss of income. So that way you're getting ahead of it and saying, well, I don't have this income anymore. Let's go ahead and readjust it now rather, rather than wait two years when they finally catch up. 
So you can contact them. All right. So now back to tax planning and maximizing your after-tax dollars. Remember, I mentioned there are different tax consequences for the different kinds of accounts here. This is going to play into your withdrawal strategy and where you take money from. It's also why our, your financial planners and advisors are always talking about diversifying the accounts from Roth IRAs to tax deferred accounts to taxable accounts. It's because it's going to give you so much more flexibility having these different buckets. And I'm going to go through as a refresher of what those different buckets are. So kicking off with taxable accounts, these are your brokerage, your individual, your joint, and your trust investment accounts. They're invested with after-tax dollars, so you're not getting a retirement benefit of either a deduction or a gross tax-free like the other two that we'll discuss in just a moment. These are accounts that are taxed from the income they produce and then the gains when you sell securities. Income like interests and non-qualified dividends, they're going to be taxed at your ordinary income tax bracket. That's that slide a few slides ago that show the different tax brackets and can be as high as 37% at the moment. Long-term capital gains and qualified dividends are taxed at capital gain rates, which can be as low as 0%. So there is a difference in the income and how they're being taxed, and we should be aware of that as well. So these accounts are not tax sheltered. They're not retirement accounts. They're your own personal investment accounts with after-tax dollars. So it's important to keep in mind that they're, they operate a little bit differently. If I needed to withdraw $25,000 from a taxable account, it would only be potentially the realized gains from a sale of securities that would be taxed. So it's not necessarily the full $25,000. But this is going to be different when we look at the other accounts. So for the tax deferred accounts, like your traditional 401k and your IRAs, these have dividends and interest as well because they're invested. But these are all tax sheltered. So what's happening day to day in these accounts are not being taxed. However, the amount when you withdraw it is fully taxable. So if you were to withdraw that same 25,000, that full 25,000 would be taxed. And it's going to actually be taxed at the ordinary income tax bracket. So again, as high as 37%. Capital gains is usually lower. So we're you know, usually trying to target that more than the ordinary income tax bracket a lot of times. The thought is when you put in the contribution into these tax deferred accounts is that you received a deduction. So it reduced your taxes, whether it's in the 401k, so it came off of your wage, uh, taxable wages, or you know, you did an IRA and it was on your uh, IRA contribution and it was on your tax return. You received a deduction when you put the money in. So now it's time the IRS wants you to pay the taxes on it. So when you withdraw it, you're actually paying taxes on the full amount that you withdraw. And it, that includes any earnings that happen within the account. Now, for the tax-free accounts, those are going to be Roth 401ks and Roth IRAs. They're similar to tax-deferred accounts because they're typically retirement accounts, right? And they don't have the income that happens day-to-day -day or year-to-year -year within the account, the interest, the dividends, um, any investment income. They're all sheltered from tax, what's happening within that account. However, when you go to and when you go to withdraw it, there is no taxes paid on the distribution because you didn't receive a deduction when you put money into this Roth IRA. So not even the earnings are going to be taxed in the Roth IRA. So this can be a really big advantage, obviously, as you can see long term, it's a pretty powerful tool to have a Roth account because you can have it grow long term and you won't be paying taxes on any of those compound earnings. So again, we like to see all diversity between these accounts, so be aware of that as well. But really, why does all this matter? Well, when determining where to take money from, you'll want to know the tax consequences for the different accounts. So even if you know you only have $15,000 of room left in your tax bracket and you need maybe $20,000, $30,000 for a purchase of some sort, it's actually possible to stay in that same tax bracket if we know what we're working with because they have different tax consequences. So a little tax planning goes a long way um, in, like I said, diversifying not only your investments, but also the type of accounts you hold will, will really kind of set you up for success. On the next slide, I'll show you a chart that shows the differences in withdrawal strategies. So I went through the different accounts that are there, but how does this really kind of translate with when, when you're going to withdraw? So this chart here explains the importance of planning your withdrawal strategy. It's going to show you a couple different uh, scenarios this person went through. The orange line is someone that decided to just take it all from that taxable brokerage account. The Maybe they were kind of thinking, oh, well, it's, it's going to save me some taxes today because I'll be taxed at that capital rain rate, which 
capital gain rate, which is more beneficial a lot of times. However, thinking for long term and the future and not just today, that might have not been the right choice. So we also look at other scenarios. The blue line is going to show us somebody that took from the IRA first. So their withdrawal was all coming from their IRA. And then the gray line is that same person if they had a withdrawal strategy that took advantage of both types of accounts. One that's also one's taxable and one that is an IRA. And we can see that gray line is a lot higher than that, that blue line. It's pretty substantial that their after tax wealth was a lot higher when they split that withdrawal. Now, this isn't to say that you should say, let's just split withdrawals 50-50 between an IRA and a brokerage account. Uh, Corey mentioned this earlier. Advice is very personalized to your situations and planning, not just for today and long term and what your goals actually are. However, it is to say there, there's some thought that goes into looking through the different accounts and what might work for you. So the bottom line is that, you know, when you're looking at tax planning, it really can add substantially to your bottom line and maximize your wealth. All right. So I'm going to add another layer to all of this. We talked about a little bit about withdrawal strategies and the tax consequences of all the different types of accounts. I'm going to throw in another layer, which is sometimes we want to consider Roth conversions. This is because you, you can say, why should I voluntarily pay tax? Well, at 73 or 75, depending on your age, uh, you are required to take distributions from your IRA. Again, that account has never been taxed before. So the IRS says, hey, 73, 75, it's time to, to take a, a percentage out every single year. We call these your required di distributions or your RMDs for shorthand. And these are going to be taxed at that ordinary income tax rate. So a Roth conversion looks at your taxes now as well in the, as in the future and says, should I voluntarily pay tax on the amount of your choosing? It can be 50,000, it could be 10,000, it could be 100,000, you know, the amount of your choosing that fits into your plan and convert it from the IRA now into the Roth before this happens. Um, now, why would you vol voluntarily pay taxes? Well, let's say you look at your tax rates and you say, well, they're likely going to go up in the future because my required distributions when I turn 73 are pretty high, actually. So it's going to bump up my tax bracket. Or it could be that you have a pension due or some kind of income in the future that you know about. Well, shifting your tax bracket or ta the tax now by doing the Roth conversion in a lower tax bracket can make a lot of sense, especially considering we are putting it into a tax-free bucket like the Roth. Roth accounts do not have required distributions and are tax-free when you withdraw from them. There are also great accounts to inherit. Um, so if you're looking at future legacy planning, this is a great account to, to really build out for your heirs. On the next slide, I'll show you how the Roth conversions can impact your tax brackets over time. So I like this example because you can kind of, you know, really visually see what's going on here. So each uh, there's columns for each strategy here. So de demonstrating the base first, where no Roth conversions were made, and what this person's tax brackets look like over time. Then we have the next column that shows Roth max 22%. And this is going to show what our brackets look like over time if we chose to convert as much as we could in a 22% tax bracket when our income was lower. And then finally, there's the Roth max 24%. Same thing, except we're maximizing the 24% bracket, meaning we're saying, let's put as much raw conversion as we can in that 24% tax bracket. So again, you're voluntarily paying tax ahead of time. But the reason why we dug into this a little bit is because we could see that eventually this person's tax bracket went up to 33%. So the first thing I see when I look at this chart is there's a lot of green in those last two scenarios, right? But there's not purple. And again, that purple is representing that 33% tax bracket. So by doing Roth conversions, we can see that we eliminated that in the other scenarios and we kept brackets under 33% during this person's lifetime. If we also look at the total tax, it's on the bottom there, um, how the total tax different, was different between these different scenarios, we can see about a $200,000 difference in pa taxes paid over time based on doing these Roth conversions. So this is all by planning ahead. OK, uh, so on the next slide, we're going to show how we can incorporate all of these things together. So we talked about the different types of accounts, different types of withdrawal strategies that are potentially there for you. And then I layered in, well, we could also be thinking about Roth conversions as well. So what does this mean when we incorporate all of this together? 
Well, now you can see that same chart from earlier, except we're adding in this yellow line here that shows using partial Roth conversions as well. And we can see that we improved our after-tax wealth over time and that the yellow line beat them all. Now, I can't stress enough, I think we've maybe mentioned it a few times, but it's just it's just true, is everyone's goals are going to be looking different. Their lifestyle, their accounts, their tax situation is different. So when we're looking at these, these slides together, it can seem really daunting, and it is to some degree, um, but that's why you work alongside your professional team to make sure that they're looking at the right path for you and your situation and your, your goals over your lifetime. Now, in the interest of time, I do want to briefly talk about a couple of little other things when it comes to maximizing your after-tax dollars during retirement. So being strategic about charitable giving. If you are a charitably inclined individual, there are strategies out there to utilize to make your gifts more efficient. A couple of them are grouping or bunching charitable donations by using what we call a donor advised fund that can really accelerate having a, a larger deduction depending on what's going on income wise in a given year. Um, and then there's also uh, qualified charitable distributions, which are non-taxable distributions directly from your IRA to a charity at 70 and a half and beyond. And this is going to be, this is very useful when you're hitting that 73 or 75 age, especially when those required distributions are, are, um, are required for you. So that's going to be really helpful to potentially use charitable donations to satisfy that requirement. Next is healthcare credits. This is a big topic for people that retire before Medicare. So if you retire before 65, planning needs to go around healthcare costs. I, I think most of us are aware that they're pretty expensive at these days. So there's a lot of, that can go into that. But I will say, you know, premium tax credits may be available and some planning around that is very beneficial. It can help cover costs for health insurance via, and you can go to the healthcare healthcare.gov website. And you can actually kind of look there and see what plan prices look like, what your income needs to be to potentially, you know, get a credit towards your premiums. And there's opportunities to plan around that if we're, if we know we're planning for somebody that's retiring before 65. So you review your cash flow needs with your professional team and we'll look for tax bracket opportunities to try to keep those income levels below the threshold so you can qualify. And then next is to determine if there are opportunities to realize capital gains and or losses. So consider realizing more capital gains potentially when you're in a lower tax bracket. This could be even at 0%. So you're realizing gains at no tax to you. So that's a really great opportunity to kind of eliminate those so you don't have to worry about that in the future. And then on the flip side, you can also look for tax loss harvesting opportunities, and that can save current and future taxes. So tax loss harvesting opportunities, those are going to be looking for losses and when the market is down and taking advantage of that opportunity, keeping your investment philosophy the same, but taking advantage of the opportunity to, opportunity to lock in losses that you can use for your current year taxes as well as in the future. So very can be a very uh, powerful tax strategy for you. So that's what we had on the tax side. Uh, back to you, Corey. Yeah, thanks, Taryn. And just want to take a, a quick moment. So Taryn and I have covered a lot today from creating a financial plan, which involves budgeting, to a plethora of tax strategies, whether it's realizing capital gains at a low rate, Roth conversions, charitable giving. So we threw a lot of information at you today. So if you look in the chat now, um, we're going to be posting a link to schedule a free 15-minute call with one of our advisors just to start helping you through that process and to see if Savant is a good fit for all your planning needs. And Taryn and I are going to finish with a little bit of Q&A. So let me take a quick second here to pull that up. Um, and let's see here. Okay, so we have a couple questions. Taryn and I will answer a couple. Uh, I see a lot that have came in. So we'll do a couple. If we don't reach your question today, we will have someone reach out to make sure that question gets addressed. So Taryn, I think this first one is for you. And it is, how do I know what my tax brackets will be in the future? Gotta be for me because it's taxes. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's a great question. Um, 
because we, you know, you throw a lot out uh, out there. I threw a lot out there about taxes, but in short, we don't know with absolute certainty um, what your tax brackets will be in the future. But we can make some educated assumptions. So working with a financial advisor or a tax planner, they're going to run projections based on what we know now. Or you know, work with them because the information is only as good as the information that is received, right? So you kind of have to work, and they're aware of some things that you you're planning. Um, but yeah, that's why plans are important to have, but also having some flexibility in that. So if, you know, we go and look at projections one day or, you know, over a 20 year time frame, and then we get back together and something's changed, we need to have flexibility in that as well. So it's not a one and done uh, with that's most financial planning, to be quite honest, is that it's something that you have to continuously monitor. I'm going to say this, though, tax brackets are subject to go back to our old tax rate system in 2026. So that's something we're really aware of, that that's a potential change, and those would likely be higher brackets. So it's something that we're aware of. Uh, but we'll plan for long, you know, long term, we'll develop a plan, and then we're going to confirm that year to year as an ongoing process. Great question. All righty. So Corey, you're up. Let's see. Is there a specific savings goal that is safe to retire on? I hear a lot of analysts state you can retire on 1 million retirement savings, but is that enough? Yeah, and, and that goes to some of the general generalities we talked about, like a 4% sustainable withdrawal rate. And in the past, a million dollars was always the figure. If you could get to a million dollars, you would be able to safely retire. But as Taryn and I pointed out multiple times today, everyone's situation is different. So there isn't a straight up yes or no to whether a million dollars is enough. It really depends on your goals. And that's why it's vitally important before you retire to start planning, to create that financial plan to say, okay, here's how much I can spend in retirement and here's how much it's going to last me. Because um, like I said, everyone's different. So some people want to have a very extravagant retirement. They want to do a lot of travel. They have a high monthly spend, whereas other people live a more frugal lifestyle. And it also depends how much risk you take. Some people have a very high risk appetite where they're still investing 90 or 100% of their funds in the stock market, whereas other people who are more conservative pull back and maybe they only have half of their funds in the stock market. So everyone's different. There is no general number, whether it's one, 1 1.5, 2 million, there's no general number on what's safe to retire. It's all going to depend on your specific goals in retirement. And I see the next question that came in here, Taryn, I believe this one's for you. It is, how do I know if I qualify for healthcare credits? Uh, okay, so this is going to change year to year because it's based on income. Um, there's also, you know, tax laws that are at play here too. So it's one thing to, we consider it as something we want to plan. A lot of times we actually don't put it in our retirement projections or those cash flow projections that Corey showed, just because we don't want to count on something permanently that could change at any given moment. But if we're looking for, you know, in the short term to qualify for these credits, uh, this is going to change year to year based on your income and your household size. That's what they base the credits on. I did say earlier that healthcare.gov, they, they, that's you know, a pretty good website to be able to kind of play around and see how that could affect you. You can see plan prices and you can see how that credit actually goes towards the, the premiums of the health insurance plans. And you know, I'd say check it out, but always, of course, work with your financial planner, or your accountant to make sure that that's something that's being considered if you are trying to qualify that. And it is really important. I can't stress that enough that you know, planning for those healthcare costs before 65, if you're going to retire before that, is very beneficial and an important thing to do. Um, all righty, let's see. So what is the standard asset allocation of individuals in retirement? Do most individuals select a 50-50 allocation between stocks and bonds? All right, Corey. Yeah, yeah, I'll take this one. And uh, not to sound redundant, but it, it goes back to my last comment too. So there is no standard allocation in retirement, just how people spend different amounts. People have different asset allocations too, and it's all dependent on your goals to where some people, they might be able to, to invest only 50% of their allocation in bonds, 50% in stocks. 
Um, whereas others, they might need to take more risk, even while they're in retirement, in order to achieve their goals. And again, that, that's why it's so important to to get a financial plan in place, to say, given your goals, how much risk you need to take, not only while you're working, where you can afford to take more risk, but also while you're in retirement. You know, our goals for Taryn and I as advisors, it's to tell people how much risk they don't have to take. I think that's one of the most powerful parts of creating a plan is saying, when you get to retirement, you don't have to take this much risk in order to achieve all the goals you've outlined. And I think that's a big one for people, the, the psychological aspect of that, so that they can sleep well at night knowing if there is a market downturn, okay, they don't have all their assets in the stock market, right? They have some in fixed income or the bond market, which is going to be a lot smoother ride. So again, everyone's situation is different. That's why we recommend working with an advisor, working with a team of professionals to to detail out that financial plan to see how much you can spend and what asset allocation is right for you. And I know we have a lot more questions in the q and I've, I've seen them come in. Uh, that's all Taryn and I have today for time. I do want to thank everyone for coming out. Appreciate all the cute questions that did come through. If I didn't get to your question or if Taryn and I didn't, what we'll do is someone from our team is going to reach out and make sure all of your questions are addressed. Um, I do want to mention again that there is a scheduling link in the chat box. If you want to have a free complimentary 15-minute conversation with someone from Savant to see if we can help, I encourage you to set up that meeting. It's not going to take a lot of your time, uh, but it will help determine if we can add value to your life. So I am going to finish by just throwing up one last disclosure. Um, again, it was a pleasure talking to everyone today. Hopefully you found this beneficial and hopefully if we can help uh, set up a meeting with us. Thanks. Thanks. If you enjoyed this webinar, visit savantwealth.com slash guides and download our complimentary guidebooks, checklists, and other useful financial resources.